ask now, Lord, that you would have your spirit, Lord, just fall upon us, that we might have our eyes open to your word and to your voice, Lord, to your, your teaching, your instruction, Lord. I believe tonight, Lord, we, we need your wisdom, your clarity. Lord, we, need, uh, we just need to hear from you. Lord, I find this area of Scripture challenging, and Lord, I, I, I think it's challenging for a reason. So Lord, I just ask you to meet us there and give us what we need to hear tonight. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come into chapter 8, we come into a pretty challenging topic. We're just going to go partway through part way through the chapter tonight. But the topic in this beginning part of the chapter is the topic of healing. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, it's probably one of the most challenging topics in Scripture. And what I want to tell you right off the bat is I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers. I may have just as many questions as you. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is where I'm at tonight. Because it seems like this is one area where I keep learning. I keep learning and I keep discovering. And, I, and, and even there's been times where I've changed my mind about certain things. So I, I just want to come with that transparency. I'm not here to tell you this is... Absolutely, but this is absolutely what I think right now. Um, and I think this is one of those areas, and there's not a whole lot of them, but I think this is one of those areas where there's room. There's room for us to disagree. There's room for us to agree to disagree. Um, because it's not a salvation issue. It, it's not a, a tented, tented, uh, a tented, what's the word I'm looking for? Tenant. It's not a tenet of, the, of our foundational beliefs that, that we would split ways over it. <clears throat> so we'll discover tonight what the, the Lord has for us on this topic. And, I, and if I went around and surveyed, every one of you would have a different angle, a different opinion on this topic, your own experiences. And, and that difference just goes out from individuals, it goes into denominations. I mean, there's just so many differences on what this, <clears throat> what this means and how we're to relate to it with the Lord So let's just read through verse 17. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she she arose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. So if we go back up to the beginning of the chapter, and we'll start there, and we're just going to kind of do a, a little bit of an exploration of this topic of healing before we actually dig into the verses that we just read. 
Now, the leper asked something pretty interesting. And he said it in the way of a statement. And he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And so I start off with some things I know for sure. What I know for sure is Jesus can heal. And what I know for sure on the heels of that is that he did heal. And what I know from my own eyewitness, he does heal. So he can, and he did, and he does. I know all of that for certain. Then I come to the question of willingness. Is he willing to heal? I don't have an answer for that. Because as far as I observe in the scripture, it's individual cases, just like with this leper. And so when it comes to willingness, I don't know. Why, why don't I know? Because in my own witness, I've seen people not healed. And so I believe, I believe, that there is a willingness on Jesus' part to heal for some and yet not others. And can I explain that? No. No. And, and, I, and I dare not even try. So let's, let's go explore a little bit. <clears throat> you can try to keep up with me if you want in the turning of pages or just write down the addresses and kind of go back and read them later. But on this idea of willingness, I just want to jump over to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. It says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, in Jesus, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. And so there is that familiar thought that those of us that have walked with the Lord for a while know that if we ask in line with his will, his willingness, we will receive that which we've asked for. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. So if there is a willingness and we ask, then we will get what we've asked for. I mean, he said, ask anything of me with that caveat, if it lines up with my will. And he didn't say, I'll think about it. He didn't say, get back to me later. He said, you will receive it. So we know that his, his will is very important and our asking is very important. I can't speak for his will. I can speak for my asking. So let's consider some, some factors in this topic. If Jesus, and these are, these are my thoughts, so I, I want to just give that caveat. These are, these are my thoughts about this topic. If, if God is always willing to heal, then there would be no Christian sick. Period. I mean, and you could take that to the extent that then how would a Christian ever die? If every Christian was healed of every malady they ever had. I just say that's a thought we need to consider. Another thought to consider is God sometimes uses illness to accomplish his will. So is Jesus willing, in that case, maybe not to heal, but his will is that someone who is sick, that sickness would be used to bring about some purpose. And I think a lot of us could testify to that, either in our own lives or the lives of people we know. Another thing to consider is that God's blessings come in other ways than physical healing. There's many ways that God blesses. And we can't assume, and we should be dangerous to do so, that he can only bless me when I'm in a restored state. I, I don't see scripture bear that out. And then... One other thing, and I feel this is really important for us to know, because of those three considerations, we really can't and we shouldn't jump to the conclusion, and I'm going to make it strong, ever, that someone that we've prayed with, prayed for, seen prayed for, prayed for themselves, that isn't healed, we should never assume it's because of their lack of faith or because of sin in their life. However... It could be one or both of those. 
but I don't believe it's our place. And I believe we need to be really careful, even if we question that, because it can come, come across without love. It can come across as an accusation, and it is just something we need to be very careful with. We need God's wisdom in that very deeply. It could be, though. I mean, I want to make sure you understand it. it the healing may not come because that person has no faith. And it may come because that person is in sin and has things to repent of. But we need to be careful about the ones that would determine that. Now, it's interesting because those that feel strongly about healing, which I believe as believers we should, will usually stand on the fact that Jesus healed everyone. And I'm going to talk more about that here in a moment. But, you know, there is an interesting group that he didn't heal. He didn't heal. And I want to go over and visit them here for a moment. Over in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, beginning in the first verse. Listen. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could, not, he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So in those six verses, we read about a group of people that are, one, offended. They're offended at Jesus. And that word offended there means they've been tripped up. They've stumbled over who Jesus has presented himself to be. I'm shocked when I find it, but I have found it. And sometimes I'm shocked that I didn't, that it, sometimes I'm shocked that I'm surprised to find it, that people, even believers, can be offended by Jesus. And you'll hear that sometimes in discussions about things as marvelous as grace. I've seen people offended by grace. Offended by it, because how dare the Lord forgive him, her, that, this. We can be offended by the goodness of our Lord. And we need to be careful with that. But here was a group that were offended by the, the power that he had. Probably, I would guess, the conviction that they felt. The conviction that they felt. How dare he? He also mentions here that in this group was unbelief. But we read in verse 5 that he did heal some. Who did he heal? Well, from every other picture of Jesus healing, I would say he healed those that, one, weren't offended, two, had belief, and three, came to him. They came to him. But all others here, it says he didn't. He wasn't able to do that work amongst them. So who were those? It was those who didn't come. It was those because the offense was too great, the unbelief was too great, and they failed to come. And so does Jesus heal all? Well, if it's his will to heal and a person comes, then I believe the healing is there. If he's willing to heal and the person does not come and does not ask, then I believe that the healing wouldn't happen. So it makes something very interesting for us to ponder. If you don't come and you don't ask, then you don't know. Think about that. If you don't come and you don't ask, then you don't know. Because if I assume from a standing still position, he does not want to heal me. I don't know that to be true. If it's the desire of my heart to be healed, then I have to be curious about his will for me. And if I don't come and I don't ask, I won't know. 
And it's as simple as that. Now, what if I ask, what if I come and he doesn't want to heal? Then I won't be healed, but then there must be a reason. And that's another place where we can find offense. That's another place that our, our belief can be affected, our faith can be affected. And when we find ourselves not being healed, maybe it's a matter of waiting, maybe it's a matter of praying more, I believe that's okay. But it also may be a time where we start to ask the Lord, then what? Then why? What would you have for me in this? What would you have be done through me through this? Because I believe that as a believer, and I need and I have a need of healing, and the will is of the Lord is not there, then there must be a reason that I have what I have. And if I make myself available to him in that, he'll use me. He'll use me. Not always the answer we want. Not always the answer that we seek. So maybe another question that you could have, I know I've thought about it. Why heal at all? Why, why would Jesus heal at all? We earned our fallen state by our biblical parents in the garden. We earned this fallen state in a fallen world. We've earned, in a sense, all the decay, all the disease. It all came from that first couple. And so we're born into that as sons and daughters of Adam. And so it would be very easy, I believe, for the Lord to say, well, I mean, that's what you've earned. That's the state. And he could even point to us that believe to the future, to our hope of heaven and say, it'll come. It'll come. You don't need it now. You're sinners saved by grace. And there's just, there's consequences to living here in a fallen world. So why? Why heal it all? Why did, it, why did Jesus start that whole part of his ministry? Well, let me back up for a second. You start at the beginning of this great story and you go forward. We don't see any healing at all for about 2,500 years. No mention of it, at least. And then there's a loose story in Genesis about Abraham where maybe some healing took place. Then we don't see anything until we get to Moses. And there, there's, a, there's a case there where it seems that someone got healed. And we really don't see much in that way. But then... God the Son comes at the behest of God the Father and he begins this earthly ministry leading to the cross and the tomb that we might have this reconciliation. But to understand still, why would he begin to heal? Why would, why would this be such a part of his ministry? Well, we, to answer that, we need to consider what was it that Jesus began to preach? Jesus came and he didn't begin talking about the cross. He didn't, he didn't begin talking about what price the Son of God and man would have to pay. He came and he began to espouse one thing, and that was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the fact that it was at hand. And when you say at hand, it means one, it's imminent, and two, it's close. And that's what he preached. That was the good news. That was the original gospel message. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, at hand, imminent, close. And he had the ability, being the fullness of the Godhead, having come from heaven, to demonstrate, to open up the eyes and the ears of those around him to how good that was. How good that kingdom that's coming is. So I believe these miracles that we saw were temporary openings of windows into heaven. Temporary windows into what it is going to be like to be fully restored. Now we know that Jesus came to save. He came to restore. And not just people. We've got to be careful. He came to restore all. In the end, all will be restored. He also came to beat Satan. He came to beat evil. And even though that the fullness of that wouldn't come and we're still waiting for it, he began to open up the eyes and the ears of those that could see and hear to the wondrous restoration that was already waiting for them in heaven. And I believe these were temporary windows being opened 
to the permanent state of heaven. And what a beautiful thing for him to do. And so he was casting out demons. He was cleaning up the sickness in people's lives, giving them the, those miracles we call miracles that it's everyday business for Jesus. We marvel at him, but what he was saying is, look, this is what you're already waiting for. This is what it's like there, that you'll be in this perfected state without illness, without the presence of evil. Jump over to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Jesus speaking, he says, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so right there he confirms what has happened for every one of them that had a demon cast out or was healed. You've just experienced the kingdom. I just opened a window. I didn't, I didn't just show it to you. I, I pushed you through it. So you could feel what was there. You could see how good, how perfect that state of heaven is. But he's making sure they understand that it came from God. It came from God. Over in the Psalms, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3, David writes this. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Now someone could grab a hold of that and say, see, he heals all our diseases. I believe what David was saying is if your disease is healed, it was of the Lord. It's God who heals our diseases. If our diseases are taken, then it's by God. If a demon is cast out in the name of Jesus, it is his work. It's his gift. It comes directly from him. Let's go back to our text tonight, chapter 8 of Matthew. We see three different instances of healing in these 17 verses. The first one was that of a leper. Now, you probably all heard stories in your church life about lepers, just how, of, how horrible that disease was. Truth be told, it was a death sentence. It was a death sentence. And yet, even in Old Testament times, in the book of Leviticus, it was, there was, there was a, a, a price that could be paid at the temple in response to a healing if you were a leper. And so somehow, even in Leviticus, there was this hope laid that a leper could still be healed, even though I wonder how many ever saw it actually happen. But God was already making way for something that, that was probably rarely seen, if ever seen, until this moment. And so this leper, we need to understand how lonely of a life a leper would lead, live. You know, in the, mid -age, in the Middle Ages, if a person was diagnosed with leprosy, the local priest would go to that person and recite all of the words of a funeral service to them up front. Let's get the funeral done now because there's only one thing that you're going to have happen and that you're going to die of this disease. In these days, the, the laws were such that if you were a leper, you had to or actually, if you were a person and there was a leper in the crowd, you would have to stay at least four feet away from them at all times. If you were, if, if you were downwind from a leper, you were to stay 150 feet away from that individual. A leper was to call out everywhere they walked, unclean, unclean. You can imagine the social stigma of this person. Now, the rabbis of that day they took, actually took great pride in how mean they were to lepers. They'd go to the extra distance to treat them unwell. And so we see the cruelty in that. And I say all that just to bring us to the point of how good Jesus is. How good Jesus is. Because not only was he a Jewish man under this Jewish law that I just described, but he was a rabbi. He was a rabbi. 
And not only did he not stay away from this individual, he touched. He touched. And I think there's such a precious picture there of the love of our Lord. But I want you to notice something about this leper. This leper worshipped Jesus. Now, it doesn't tell us how he worshipped him. I'm figuring maybe on his knees, bowed down. There must have been a posture involved. And he came and he worshipped. And unless I've missed something, I haven't seen anybody else worship Jesus yet. The leper. The leper recognized him and he called him Lord. Lord. And in those days, he probably would have used the word Yahweh, speaking of God himself. Lord, if you are willing, I want to be cleansed. Notice he didn't just say healed. He said cleansed, made well, made whole. Which I love that picture because leprosy is always a picture of what? Sin. And Jesus cleanses of sin. His blood cleanses of sin. And those that would come and worship and ask, he will cleanse them. If not physically, certainly spiritually. Certainly spiritually. Make me clean. Before we move on, I want us to notice verse 1. He came down from the mountain. Great multitudes followed him. We're coming out of the mountain or the Sermon on the Mount. We went through those chapters. So he's now leaving that setting, so we can keep, what, keep that in mind. He's leaving that setting, coming down off the mount. The multitudes who have heard him teach are coming. I wonder if the leper was off to the side, heard Jesus teach, now he's catching up with him, willing to go, because his heart's been so stirred to ask for this healing. And he, he goes to him. And then verse 3, longer bit of the story, we have this picture of the centurion. Notice, notice every time the centurion is mentioned in the scripture, they're like good people. All the centurions, like, they're just like good people. And in this case, I believe this is a, a believing centurion who's, who's heard, he's seen the witness, and, and he's believing that, you know, on who, why else would he ask? Why would he take the risk? The centurions always seem to be good people. Something I want to point out before we go too much further. If you go into the other Gospels, there's a different order to some of the things that we're reading in Matthew. So Matthew, there's a good chance that what he's laying out in his, in his Gospel is not so much chronological. And if you study Matthew and the differences of it compared to, say, Luke and Mark, um, it's more of thematic. He kind of sticks with themes more than he does the chronological order of things. So just raise that so in case you go, well, wait a minute, this isn't how it, that's why there's four Gospels. Because there's different flavors, different emphasis for us to see. But the centurion comes and he asks Jesus for this healing for his servant Um, which is notable too, just to see the heart of the man for a servant. How many servants did this man have? How easy would it have been to replace the servant that he had? But his heart was such that he came and he risked his own reputation to ask this rabbi, who was obviously showing power and miracles, to do this healing. And Jesus marvels. And isn't it amazing? I mean, of all the characters around Jesus, of all these people in these multitudes it ends up being a roman centurion that jesus marvels over had not seen this type of faith in all of israel and then he gives a pretty stark warning beginning there about halfway through verse 10 he says surely i say to you i have not found such great faith not even in israel and i say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What's he speaking about there? He's speaking about the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit down with the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And because of their faith, and he's pointing to the centurion's faith in this case, that that, that many will come and they'll be blessed. But then he gives a warning. Verse 12 But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he says, here's a marvelous thing. From the Gentiles' nations will come those who believe and be blessed. And even from you, the Jews, 
who should be blessed, that's not a safety point. That's not something you can rely on because some of you will be cast out. So his warning is pretty, pretty stark. And of course, one of the things, or the thing that Jesus marvels at is that this man, as an officer in the military, understands authority. He understands chain of command. He understands how far his word goes, even without his presence. And so he has that illustration in his heart when he says to Jesus, I don't, I don't need you. It's not required that you come back to my house. And that centurion had probably been around the Jews long enough to know how difficult that would have been. Because a Jewish man, especially a rabbi, there was no way he was to ever enter the home of a Gentile. So he's, in a way, he's sparing Jesus of that social ill, of, of that problem culturally. He's like, you know, your authority will extend. I just need you to say the word, because just like when I say the word, my people do what I say, I know that you have the authority to make this happen. Without your presence, I won't even put you through that. And so you can see Jesus just being blown away, impressed by this officer. And so he says, verse 13, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done. So there was a willingness, and there was someone who came, and there was someone who asked. Wasn't guaranteed that answer, but that's the answer that he got. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, verse 14, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. So one of the things we see there is Peter was married. Because there's different stories about whether the apostles were married. We know Paul, it seems, was at one time. We see that Peter was married, and probably some of the others were as well. And so he came in and noticed something. In this case, we don't hear anybody ask. There's a close proximity. They're both in the same home. So we don't know. We could assume maybe somebody asked. Maybe on the way to the house, Peter would say, man, yeah, we, can, we can go, but my mom's really sick. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you could hear. I mean, we don't know. We could, we could assume a lot, but we shouldn't. And so maybe this is one of those cases that we need to understand that if, if it's his will, maybe he doesn't need to be asked at times. Maybe out of his compassion for someone, he'll just heal. And there's a chance in that we may never know. We may never know. We may have been sick, and suddenly we're better. And we're like, wow, I got over that. Or hey, that medicine worked. I mean, who knows? So, so this does allow for a different situation. And then the final part, I said three, there's actually four situations. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying... He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. So if we were going to review that first healing of the leper, we see a picture of the cleansing of sin as well, that personal touch. And you know, when you think about Jesus' personal touch, I mean, I, think, I can't, you have to think of the cross. Because the cross was his personal touch that we all may be spiritually healed. Once for all. Once for all. And then in verses 3 through 13, we see Jesus heal from a distance. That whole picture of out of sight. He can do whatever when we're not actually seeing him. Then verses 14 through 15, we see this seemingly unsolicited compassion of Jesus to touch if we don't assume that anything else took place. And then in verses 16 and 17, we see a pointing back to what Isaiah had to say. And, and what I want to do is I want to go back there to what Isaiah had to say, because I think it's very important that we consider it. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, says, Surely he, speaking of the Messiah, has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Now, I want you to think about this. It says, by his stripes we are healed. Where did he receive the stripes? On the way to the cross. He received those on the way to the cross. Now, I bring this up because I've been in many situations where healing is being prayed for. A proclamation of scripture goes forth to confirm that Jesus can do this. And very often that scripture is brought up. By his stripes we are healed. True. But all the healings that we read about were prior to the stripes. And so I think that brings for me at least a focus on his primary mission was to heal us spiritually. Why? Because we will all who believe be healed eventually. And I think that we just have to feel really good about that. He went to the cross and was raised from the ground so that we would be healed spiritually. And along the remainder of our journey here, we may come up with a need to be healed, a desire to be healed physically, and we may come and we may ask and we may receive or not. And yet we need to always know as believers by faith, we will all be made perfect. We will all be raised to incorruption someday. Future permanent healing. And I want to jump over to First Peter on the same topic. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty four and five. It says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Jesus comes and he begins to preach the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. In his love and his compassion for all those around, all those that came, all those that asked, he healed to give him those pictures of heaven through the miracles that he performed. But ultimately, where was he headed? He was headed to the cross so that by his stripes we would all be healed spiritually, those of us that believe. And then eventually a permanent healing in the end. One more thing I want to bring up in this topic of healing for our consideration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, two verses, 9 and 30, speak, the whole the chapter all speaks about the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. But in chapter, in chapter 12, verse 9 and 30, there it speaks about healing. And something interesting happens there. It says the gifts of healing. Plural. The only other time that's used is tongues. Gifts of tongues. We're not going to talk about tongues tonight. Talk about healing though. And there's two thoughts and I think both of them warrant consideration. Gifts of healing because there's many different types of healing. Many different types of healing. Many, many needs in that realm of healing. Now, we need to understand and remember that Jesus in himself, bore the fullness of the Godhead. Which means he bore the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Which means that in Jesus, the Son of God was the ability to heal all and all things. I don't believe we carry the fullness of the Godhead in us or the fullness of the Spirit. And I think that's why when something like healing comes along, although any of us could be used, I don't believe that there is a such thing as a primary gift of healing. And I guess what I'm saying there, and this may bother some, I don't believe there's anything such thing as a healer. I don't think one person is, is a healer. Because I have seen anyone willing, anyone with faith and belief, 
who asks, who prays. Anyone can be used of the Lord to heal. And I think depending upon how he works to us individually and whatever gift of healing he wants to give us at that time, he can use you, he can use me if we have faith and we pray in faith and it's his will. There's another thought with the gifts of healing is that because it isn't a permanent, char- a permanent gift, that, it, that it's, it talks about the times as, as in the plural sense, it's how many times over it's given to different people or maybe even the same person. You know? So, so there's, there's a reason it's plural. Those are my, my thoughts on it. Um, and I say that because you've all heard stories. You've all read stories. You've, you've seen evidences in movies and books and stuff that there are those that consider themselves to be a healer. And I'm guessing the Lord could rest on somebody for a long period of time and maybe use them over and over and over and over again for that particular thing. I mean, that, that's fine, but I, I just don't see that as a, as a permanent gift, that the, 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 the person is a healer. Because it really, that's one of those gifts, it's really got to be a sensitive thing to the moment, to the person, to the situation, to the Lord's will, period. But truly, with gifts, as long as we're available and asking and the Lord has a plan and a will in that moment, any gift can be for any of us. Because ultimately, they're not our gifts anyway. None of them are. Whether it's teaching or prophecy or tongue or whatever the gift might be, healing, they're not our gifts. It's what the Lord, the Holy Spirit, works through us for whatever his purposes are at any given moment. So, a lot to digest, I think. And it's interesting speaking on this because we're in a church body who sees healings like every week. Every week. And I know so that also in this church body are people that have had things they have not been healed of. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes where someone's praising the Lord for something that he's done as far as a healing. And I know, because I know, that someone else in the room is sitting there with a very similar situation or a loved one who had that situation and the healing didn't come. And I kind of cringe for them because I don't know what they're feeling at that moment. But I think that's why what we've considered tonight needs to be something we, we pray about, we understand, we meditate on. But God's got a plan, whether in sickness or in health. He can heal, he did heal, he will heal, if it's his will. Those of us that need a healing, we need to come and we need to ask, or otherwise we won't know. And so, I I feel like I don't have a conclusion to this teaching, because I think it's kind of open-ended. It's open-ended because we need to keep praying for wisdom. We need to keep praying for wisdom. I think we need to be willing to ask for healing and see what the Lord does. But I think we need to be very quick to understand when it doesn't come, even if we continue to ask, we need to have our eyes and our heart open to, okay then, Lord, what are you doing? Because we can miss it. We can miss it and we can waste it. We can get, we can get just deep in our, our pity for ourselves and, 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 and we're flesh, we're human and, and sometimes we're going to feel bad and get mad about our situations if we're carrying something that we don't want to carry. But, but we could miss the blessing in it if we're not willing to ask, okay, Lord, I'd rather be well. I'd rather not have this. I'd rather you just take it, but don't let me waste it. Don't let me waste it. And, and I think he'll honor that. I believe he'll honor that. So we'll rest there for tonight.